Okay, well, thanks for having me today. Uh, I think I saw in the, uh, I was billed as an MD PhD, so while I appreciate the honorary degree, uh, I'm only a PhD and an MS, and I'm a, basically a, a bench scientist uh, who does a lot of translational research. So that's my perspective. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about molecular pathways and that sort of thing today. Um, so anyway, let me launch in. I'm going to talk about pharmacogenetics today. Um, and I think probably one of the best compelling uh, stories for pharmacogenetics is this paper right here. It's a case report uh, about a two-year-old boy who went, uh, underwent a tonsillectomy. Um, after his surgery, everything went fine. He was an outpatient. He went home, took codeine to manage the pain, and uh, died a couple of days later of respiratory depression. Um, so. Didn't really understand why this had happened, according to the paper, um, because he had taken the correct amount of pills. There was nothing, no overdose due to the pills. But they, somebody got smart and genotyped him and found out that he has, instead of two copies of a, a gene that activates codeine into morphine called CYP2D6, right here, um, he has three copies of this gene. So everybody inherits one chromosome from mom and dad. In general, you have two genes. Uh, this kid had a duplication on one of his chromosomes uh, that gave him three copies. So he was considered an ultra-rapid metabolizer of codeine and morphine. And while there's probably about 5% of the US population has this ultra-rapid metabolizer genotype, um, this probably indicates that this kid had some other confounding issues. It wasn't just that. Nonetheless, um, had he been genotyped, codeine would have been avoided and he probably would still be alive today. Um, on the other side of the coin, um, people go to the dentist, they get dental work done, they are given codeine uh, to manage the pain when they get home. When they go home, sometimes they take the codeine and it doesn't really have much of an effect. Um, this is because there's a lot of people in the population who are deficient in CYP2D6 and cannot turn codeine into morphine. Codeine has very little analgesic effect. It's really the morphine uh, conversion that is needed for that. So the same gene can cause inefficacy and it can cause severe toxicities. Um, so I, I work at the NCI, so a lot of my slides have cancer drugs on them. Um, so this is no different. Um, there's a, a, a lot of variation in, in most drug therapies, especially in cancer. Um, but you know, you can see uh, three, to, three to 50 fold variation um, in certain drug therapies. Um, and this variability is partially oftentimes attributed to genetics, but not always. Um, which leads to the next slide. I'm sure people in this room could probably think more of more sources of variability, but uh, I'm just going to go through the, them each here. So dr drug specific dose, schedule, the dosage form, how the drug's formulated, et cetera, can affect um, the variability, body size, body composition, demographic variables such as age, race, sex can affect uh, drug therapies, physiologic, especially disease states, hepatic and renal function can affect how drugs uh, are handled in the body, um, environmental interactions like drug-drug interactions, drug-food interactions, these sorts of things can affect. Uh, and genetics is just one of these many uh, variables that will affect drug therapy. So we see this more as a useful tool and not the end-all be-all of, uh, of determining variability in drug uh, therapies. Now sometimes the genetics is extremely important and sometimes it's not important uh, barely at all. Um, so today I'm going to be primarily talking about cases where the genetics really contributes a lot to the variability and is actually useful for, uh, for making clinical decisions. Um, there's several types of pharmacogenetic um, endpoints that we use uh, at the NCI. Uh, we're, like I said, I'm a, more of a wet bench kind of guy, so I've been you know, handling a lot of the, uh, mining a lot of the samples um, in our clinical pharmacology program, primarily from cancer patients. And we will notice from time to time that there is an association between a gene SNP and some sort of clinical outcome that we can then go and figure out why this is happening. So uh, here we had a group of patients uh, with prostate cancer treated with docetaxel. We found that a polymorphism in a gene, CYP1D1, was related to the outcome. So uh, men carrying the wild type STAR1 SNP had a double overall survival compared to people carrying the STAR3 SNP. Um, this, this gene does not metabolize docetaxel, so we had to do a little investiga investigative work to figure out what was going on. Um, we found out that uh, estradiol is actually metabolized by CYP1B1. CYP1B1 is also upregulated in almost every single prostate tumor. Uh, 
Those carrying the SAR3 allele turn estradiol into a very reactive metabolite that binds to docetaxel and adducts it. And this form of docetaxel is not very potent at all. It also interferes with microtubular polymerization because this reactive form of estradiol will bind to practically everything in the cell and it really likes the sulfhydro groups on tubulin. So we would never would have found this interaction without the use of pharmacogenetics. So we use it in a discovery capacity. We're also uh, doing a lot of clinical trials at the NIH, as I'm sure you all well know. Um, and so we're often looking at variation in phenotype. So there's a molecular pathway that feeds into a variation in phenotype. So here we were studying a, uh, an investigative drug that was shown to cause QT prolongation. We knew the drug was handled by a transporter that existed in the heart. And basically the transporter functioned so that when the drug got into the heart, it was pumped back out. Patients who uh, were not able to pump the drug out as effectively because of a genetic polymorphism are shown here. They had QT prolongation, whereas patients who were more effectively able to pump the drug out had barely any, if uh, at all, QT prolongation. So here we're looking at variation of phenotype. We had the molecular pathway sort of characterized. Now both of these feed into clinical trial uh, inclusion and exclusion criteria. Um, you can take people who are responders, non-responders, or um, uh, are going to get significant toxicities. You could take them out of your population and treat them with other sorts of drugs and subset your population for people where you think the drug is going to be more effective. And all of this, of course, leads into actual translation of these findings into clinical practice. Um, so today the objectives are to review the molecular and physiological basis for drug drug inter or gene drug interactions, to appreciate the impact on drug therapy, to discuss the future of uh, pharmacogenetics and drug development and treatment. Um, so basically I'm going to sort of give you a bird's eye view of pharma pharmacogenes and what they, what they do. Um, I'm going to talk about how the molecular pathway will alter phenotype, which will then alter drug therapy. And then um, at the very end of the talk, the NIH has instituted a pharmacogenetics uh, program where a patient comes into the hospital, they are genotyped, and that genotype follows them around the hospital uh, in our computer system. So if they're given, a, if a doc wants to give them a drug, they will have to put it into this system. The system will flag if there is a genetic issue with administering that particular drug. So I'm going to talk about the drugs that we've uh, flagged as important uh, at the NIH at the end. So um, just launch in with the types of pharmacogenes. So probably the, when people think of pharmacogenetics, they tend to think of, of these sorts of interactions where you have phase one metabolism, which tends to be uh, just redox reactions that oxidize drugs. Sorry, the arrow got scooted over there. Um, so here you, you just have a drug that's oxygenated and it becomes more polar. Now this can have uh, two effects. One, it can activate drugs, like with codeine, but in general it deactivates drugs and makes them more soluble, readily excretable. Phase two metabolism is also the chemical modification of a drug. Uh, here you take a polar R group uh, and add it onto the drug, so you have drug, drug R, the R is polar, it's more soluble and easier to detoxify the drug. Um, before I go into the, the SIPs that I'm going to talk about, um, it's helpful to think about what are the major SIPs that metabolize most of the pharmaceutical armamentarium. Um, in general, it's CYP3A4. Uh, 3A family probably metabolizes 40 to 60 percent of, of the drugs that are available right now. This is an old slide, but little has changed uh, in the last uh, 13, 14 years. Um, this gene really does not have very many uh, genetic uh, polymorphisms that are very predictive. So I'm not really going to talk about CYP3As today. However, the next two most frequent metabolizers of drugs, CYP2C9 and CYP2D6, do have some very important uh, genetic variants that will alter their activity. So I'm going to talk about those today. Um, Phase two metabolizing enzymes tend to be the UGTs. You have uh, you know, these UGTs in the liver that glucuronidate drugs and make them more readily excretable in the bile and urine. Um, then your sulfur transferases um, and then a host of others that uh, are more or less uh, important in the major uh, metabolism of multiple drugs. Um, I'm going to talk about TPMT today. Even though this is a very small sliver, this particular uh, gene is, is quite important uh, in pharmacology.
So um, I'm going to give you uh, the first example here, CYP2D6 and tamoxifen. So I already mentioned codeine will activate, uh, or I'm sorry, CYP2D6 will activate codeine. CYP2D6 actually also activates tamoxifen. When tamoxifen was developed, people were thinking, I believe that the NDM or the 4-hydroxy were the major metabolites that were actually active. Um, relatively recently, some studies at Georgetown proved that it was endoxifen that's really the active compound of tamoxifen. Uh, endoxifen is formed through n methyl tamoxifen, which I'm going to call NDM, um, and it, it forms this compound, which is three to hundredfold uh, more active than tamoxifen or NDM alone. Um, also, when, when uh, tamoxifen was, was being used, people noticed that SSRIs actually inhibited the, uh, the hot flashes that people would experience when they were uh, you know, undergoing tamoxifen therapy. And I don't think people really understood why until recently when they found that really what they were doing was inhibiting the enzyme that formed the active metabolite. So you had less active metabolite and less hot flashes due to that. Um, so it's kind of useful to think about uh, how does the population break down in terms of 2D6 genetics. We would expect, just to back up, that people who were deficient in this would have more indesmethyl tamoxifen to endoxifen ratio. People who were very rapid would have more endoxifen to NDM. Um, the poor metabolizers who do not form as much of the active metabolite comprise probably about 10% about of the population roughly, um, and they're at the top right here. Um, on the bottom right, you'll see about another maybe 5 to 10 percent who are ultra-rapid metabolizers. They form a lot of endoxifen, and the drug is actually probably more effective in these people especially. When the drug was developed, though, th these, two, these two extreme ends of the genetic spectrum here were, uh, were, were not the general population. The drug was really developed for people sort of in the middle. Um, and the people at the ends, unfortunately, don't benefit as well for the drug or they have more hot flashes, more toxicity to deal with. Um, so, you know, this is how the population breaks down. Go ahead and uh, talk about the plasma concentrations of the drugs now. So, if you look at the uh, endoxifen to NDM ratio and you take the population, you look at their, their plasma concentrations, you get they put it on a normit plot, which is just a, a sort of a statistical method to figure out what um, groups of people comprise uh, this population. You'll find four uh, bell-shaped curves that are very distinct of uh, endoxifen to NDM ratio. These people on the left end here have little endoxifen to NDM. These have high endoxifen to NDM. So we would expect then that if CYP2D6 was really an important genetic predictor of endoxifen concentration, that you would see this curve enriched for poor metabolizers and this one enriched for uh, rapid metabolizers. And that's exactly what you see. Uh, draw your attention to the right-hand side of the table here. The poor metabolizers over here are the major uh, constituents of group one, which has low endoxifen. The ultra-rapid or extensive metabolizers are those that uh, comprise group four, which have high endoxifen. Um, here's another way to look at the data, and uh, I wanted to point something out here. The, the poor metabolizers tend to cluster uh, low on the endoxifen um, in to NDM ratio, whereas the extensive metabolizers are high on it. However, you'll notice how much the data really spread here. There are several extensive metabolizers that look like poor metabolizers. This is because this gene is not a perfect predictor of, of, of anything. Uh, however, it is still a very useful predictor. So if you look at patients with extensive metabolizing versus poor metabolizing, how long it takes them to have recurrent breast cancer, you'll see this, where patients with extensive metabolism um, are uh, benefiting much more from tamoxifen than patients who are poor metabolizers. So basically, we think that the poor metabolism group here really is not benefiting as much from tamoxifen. They should probably be given another drug, such as an aromatase inhibitor or uh, something else. Um, whereas people who are extensive metabolizers probably benefit more from tamoxifen than they do from other drugs. So when you think about uh, you know, it, it, the, the, this issue in terms of uh, how, do, how does tamoxifen stack up with one of these aromatase inhibitors, for example, Tamoxifen is, uh, is causing a little bit more recurrence. However, this uh, part of the Kaplan-Meier analysis here is composed of a lot of poor metabolizers who are sort of dragging down the efficacy of tamoxifen. And right now, studies are really trying to compare these two uh, curves to see if uh, taking poor metabolizers out of here and moving them to here will actually improve this curve. 
And some early data from uh, one of these trials is indicating that poor metabolizers that are switched to anastrozole after two years of tamoxifen experience no increase in breast cancer recurrence. So the, the, the poor metabolizers who were switched are actually doing better than they would have done on tamoxifen is really the idea. So I talked about a, uh, a, a phase one metabolizing enzyme, CYP2D6. Now I'm going to switch gears and talk about phase two metabolizing enzymes. I'm going to talk about uh, thiopurine methyltransferase and 6 mercaptopurine um, and its analogs. So thiopurine methyltransferase just simply methylates drugs and deactivates them through methylation. 6 mercaptopurine and its analogs are used to treat ALL, um, inflammatory bowel disease, and autoimmune disorders. Uh, they're fairly heavily used in the transplant community as well, um, especially azathioprine in the transplant community. I'll mention that in a minute. Um, these, these drugs basically just incorporate cytotoxic thioguanine nucleotides into the DNA, which causes the cell to die. However, they also do a second thing. They, they uh, inhibit de novo purine synthesis. So the cell is not as able to, is to synthesize DNA and divide as it otherwise would be. So they're, they're very good drugs. Um, six mercaptopurine was heavily used in childhood ALL. And uh, some of the initial pharmacogenetic studies actually were, were very concerned with this drug because this drug can cause um, severe hemotoxicity in uh, childhood patients, can cause death. Uh, so St. Jude was very interested in it, and it was heavily developed uh, at St. Jude. So um, the TPMT, which uh, basically functions to take azathioprine, which is converted into 6-MP, right, and then it goes to either one of two fates, inhibiting de novo purine synthesis or incorporating into DNA and leading to cytotoxicity. But before it can do that, uh, it, it will see a lot of TPMT in the, in the blood and, and other tissues where it just gets methylated and inactivated. So when the drug was developed, the dosing was based off of people who were very able to metabolize or captopurine through TPMT and inactivate it. Um, so the metabolism of these uh, mercaptopurine drugs is decreased with polymorphic TPMT variation by up to 200-fold. So 200-fold is a, a very large number in, uh, in, in, in any therapy, and it has a lot of uh, cytotoxicity in patients who are not able to uh, methylate it and get rid of it. And these are the kids that are really experiencing some very severe toxicity from uh, 6-MP. So uh, I'll talk about the SNPs in a second. Um, the rapid metabolizers are resistant to the drug. The slow metabolizers are at risk. So the rapid metabolizers are these wild-type individuals who have functional TPMT. They're about 80 to 98 percent of the population, depending on which population you're looking at. Um, the intermediate metabolizers, uh, are, they carry one wild-type allele and one allele that's not functional. And they're about 65, they need about 65 percent of the dose. Um, but they have some uh, toxicity, but it's not nearly as severe as, as this group down here of slow metabolizers who carry two copies of these two TPMT deficiency alleles. And they require about 10 to 15 percent of the ori original dose. And if you're talking about kids, these people are also at risk for secondary malignancies. So you give them these drugs in childhood, they could develop cancers later on because they were just administered too much for what they needed. Um, I just got some results back from the largest uh, pediatric cohort treated with azothioprine, um, and the results are very positive. The exact same thing uh, is going on with azothioprine as it is with 6-MP, and the results should be published within the next year. Um, so it's not only 6-MP that's affected, it's these other drugs as well, and it's not just pediatric patients, it's also adult patients. Um, oh, by the way, I wanted to mention one other thing. The, the genetic variation in TPMT explains 95% of these hemotoxicity issues with 6-MP. Um, so all of this information is high level of evidence. I'll talk about levels of evidence in a minute. Um, but it's made it into the package insert of uh, 6-MP at least. And uh, the, the package insert says that substantial dosage reductions may be required to avoid the development of life-threatening bone marrow suppression in these patients. Now, I'm not a clinician, but I have heard that there is not a lot of genotyping in these patients going on. And uh, this is something that probably needs to be translated clinically to avoid some of these severe toxicities, especially in children. So I'm going to switch gears again to talk about UGT1A1. This is also a phase two metabolizing enzyme, uh, very important. It is uh, involved. Uh, first, let me talk about the SNPs. So you have the, these TA repeats in the promoter of UGT1A1. 
normal um, functioning UGT1A1 has six TA repeats. Uh, a gene that carries seven TA repeats is expressed much less effectively in the, uh, in the liver. And if people carry two copies of this allele called UGT1A1 star 28, they have a decreased expression and function of UGT1A1. UGT1A1 is the primary glucuronidator of bilirubin, so these patients have a slight jaundice phenotype known as Gilbert syndrome. And this is about 10% of the U.S. population has this deficiency. There's some other SNPs also that are predictive. I'm not going to go through them, though. Um, these SNPs explain about 40% of the variability in glucuronidation reactions uh, as a whole. Um, glucuronidation is absolutely key in arenotecan um, toxicity. So uh, arenotecan is administered IV, goes into the blood, uh, these carboxylesterases cleave um, certain groups off of arenotecan that turn it into its active metabolite called SN38. SN38 is rapidly glucuronidated by UGT1A1 uh, and is completely detoxified when that happens. If a patient's unable to uh, glucuronidate their SN38, the drug becomes very toxic and you can see some severe ADRs again. Um, however, this is very dependent on the urinotecan dose, and this is really what I wanted to bring up. Um, at high dose, uh, almost 100% of the patients who carry this SNP get uh, severe uh, hemotoxicity, whereas you know, a, uh, a moderate amount of, of patients with, uh, with wild-type alleles get the hemotoxicity. However, if you go down to uh, 125 megs per meter squared, the, uh, this, this SNP no longer really matters at all. So this is a very dose-dependent situation. And so sometimes when we think of pharmacogenetics association, we have to consider other issues other than just the gene. Um, yeah, we go ahead. So uh, renotecan toxicity uh, through glucuronidation reactions has made its way into the package insert of the drug. Um, the, the package insert, the, the, this one says that the glucuronidation of bilirubin, um, such as those with Gilbert syndrome, um, people with that will, will be at a greater risk of myelosuppression. I think the updated one actually does list UGT1A1 star 28 now. Um, switch gears from phase two metabolizing enzymes to transporters. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, one, one transporter in particular that's been um, uh, very highly studied in the past five years and I think is in, on its way to making it into um, pharmacogenetics directed therapy. Um, it's this OATP1V1 here. So a patient receives a statin, it goes into the gut goes through the gut wall into the portal, portal blood. Um, it can be metabolized in the gut wall by CYP3A4 or pumped back into the gut wall by MDR1 and MRP2. Once in the portal blood, um, it basically needs to see an OATP. Uh, OATP1B1 is the primary uh, transporter of, uh, of, of simvastatin. There are some other OATPs that are very important. But unless this uh, statin sees an OATP, it does not very effectively get into the liver cell. Uh, once in the liver cell, it's metabolized and eliminated. Um, some of it uh, makes it into the bloodstream and, and you know, you, you, you have varying levels of AUC exposure um, in these patients. What happened there? Uh, here's, a, um, here's a slightly more complex uh, version of, of what's going on in the liver cell. Um, there's a SNP in this gene, a single nucleotide polymorphism SNP in this gene that affects how much statin actually gets into the liver cell. Uh, the SNP is, uh, is a, what's called a non-synonymous um, transition. You have in, um, in, in, in most people, is the wild type allele at a, a position 130 gets changed to a D. Um, and this actually has a great effect on um, AUC exposure of, of statins. We knew this back in 2006. A very good paper was published showing that this thing is, is heavily linked to the AUC of statins. Now, greater exposure to statins can lead to statin-induced myopathies. So in patients carrying the SNP that can't get their statins into the liver cell as well, you worry that they're overexposed and they're going to get a myopathy. Uh, an, another study was published more recently looking at 500,000 uh, alleles in the, uh, the genome. Um, I, I love this study. It shows that only one polymorphism was uh, associated with statin-induced myopathy. And not only was it associated, it was several orders of magnitude over the association threshold, which is denoted by that, that brownish line there. This SNP is almost in 100% complete linkage, meaning it's co-inherited with that N130D SNP. 
So this SNP is probably just a passenger that's riding along with the N130D SNP causing overexposure to statins and statin-induced myopathies. This group um, also took these data in, into a validation cohort where they had cumulative percentages of uh, myopathy and uh, they found that again they, they see the same SNP um, is about 20% of the patients are getting statin-induced myopathy um, and about 60% of statin-induced myopathy cases could be attributed to this SNP. So this is a very predictive allele. Um, and the present SNP has, uh, has a 15% representation in the U.S. population. So this is a very frequent SNP. There's a lot of people getting statins that are probably at risk for myopathy just due to this issue alone. Um, at this point, the FDA has not really weighed in on whether or not we should genotype for this one yet, um, but I think it's coming soon. And at the NIH, uh, we are genotyping for this. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, targets today as well. So, uh, you know, drugs are designed to, to bind to something in the body, and, uh, you know, so these are drug targets. Um, most people, when they think of drug targets, think of, you know, your imatinibs of the world where they, it's targeted to a somatic mutation um, in something like BCR ABLE. I'm not really going to talk about that today because I'm really concerned more with the germline variation, the DNA that mom and dad gave us, not mutations uh, in tumors. There are other types of targets uh, that, are, that are subject to germline variation, um, and I'm going to talk about that instead. So uh, before I get to the targets, here are two cytochromes P450 that take warfarin and convert it into an inactive form of warfarin. Um, so these, more hydroxylation through 2C9 and CYP4F2 leads to less active warfarin uh, in the bloodstream. Um, but I'm not going to really focus on the CYP story, I'm going to focus over here. Warfarin is designed to bind the vitamin K oxidoreductase C1. By doing so, it reduces uh, the amount of reduced vitamin K, um, which reduced vitamin K is uh, pro-clotting, um, has a pro-clotting function. So warfarin binds to this target. There's a SNP in this target gene, VKORC1, that has the, uh, it causes the expression of the gene to go down by many fold. So if a patient uh, lacks uh, sufficient expression of VKORC1, warfarin will bind it all up and cause bleeding events. Um, brief aside on CYP4F2, um, it was fairly recently discovered um, using a platform I'm going to talk about in a minute called the DMET platform. Um, here's the association, it's very strong. The FDA has again not weighed in on this one, but I think it's going to be uh, up and coming. So um, here is the incidence of warfarin sensitivity, um, I like this paper a lot, uh, showing basically what what causes warfarin sensitivity in the general population. And you can see this sort of red, pink uh, piece of the pie chart and this yellow piece of the pie chart correspond to CYP2C9 and VKORC. So about 40% of warfarin sensitivity in the general population can be attributed to these polymorphisms alone. Um, incidentally, uh, the CYP2C9 polymorphism, which metabolizes warfarin, is about 1 to 15 percent of the U.S. population. VKORC variants are more frequent, especially in Caucasians. About 40 percent of us carry uh, these SNPs that lower VKORC1, and it's about 12 percent in African Americans. Um, if you look in the package insert, uh, you'll find this little table, which gives you a warfarin starting dose. Um, based on these two SNPs, in, uh, or actually it's three SNPs, in VKORC1 and CYP2C9. There's even a neat little iPhone app that allows you to put this information in and get a warfarin starting dose. It's pretty, pretty neat. Um, in this case, if, if, if the warfarin was already, uh, dose was already decided upon based on INRs, then obviously you don't need this information, but it still is useful as a starting dose, um, to decide on a starting dose. <coughs> Okay, I'm going to switch gears again. Um, so I talked about targets. Now I'm going to talk about um, genes that have uh, effects that are not necessarily related to the target, but um, are sort of uh, ancillary, uh, you know, targets themselves. Okay, so I'll show you what I'm talking about in a second if that doesn't make sense. Uh, so you have uh, tumor lysis syndrome. You have cellular breakdown, which spills out a lot of DNA. This DNA um, is, is catabolized into a lot of purines. Uh, these purines can cause hyperuricemia. Um, this uric acid can precipitate in renal tubules and, uh, and cause renal failure. So this is known as tumor lysis syndrome. 
Um, a drug is given uh, to avoid this, actually two drugs, allopurinol and rasburicase can be used. Um, rasburicase here um, takes uric acid and converts it into a readily excretable form of uric acid called allantoin. Um, here is the actual reaction um, up here. Uh, when urate is converted into allantoin, it produces a lot of hydrogen peroxide. Uh, this hydrogen peroxide is cleared by glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. Now, there's a, a group of people that do not have functional G6PD. They tend to be Mediterranean in origin, and it's the same group that cannot eat fava beans, which is why I have the broad bean up here, um, because the, the, the toxin in fava beans will actually cause the exact same thing to happen. They'll get severe hemolysis due to too much hydrogen peroxide. Just an interesting aside, uh, it's thought that this population has this deficiency because they want to produce a lot of peroxide in the bloodstream to combat malaria. It's kind of an interesting uh, idea. So anyway, um, genotyping for G6PD is a very, very good predictor of G6PD uh, function, and so this is a, a genetic test as well. Um, and the last type of um, gene-drug interaction I'm going to talk about are these hypersensitivity reactions, uh, which are, are, are becoming increasingly important, I think, in pharmacotherapy. Uh, so a drug like abacavir goes into an antigen-presenting cell uh, where it sees one of these uh, major histocompatibility complexes. These MHC proteins are encoded by human leukocyte ant antigen, which is called HLA. These are the genes in the genome, so I'm going to say HLA referring to these proteins here, the genes for these proteins anyway. These proteins will bind to your, uh, your drug, go out uh, and, and start to mount an immune response to the drug itself, which causes hypersensitivity. Um, and it's really, it's a Stevens-Johnson syndrome in, in general. And here's a, here's a kid with Stevens-Johnson. Um, this uh, is, is really considered, it's starting to be considered malpractice to not genotype for this before you give some certain drugs, especially abacavir. Um, there's similar results with carbamazepine and allopurinol. It's still only recommended by the FDA, but it's still uh, extremely predictive of uh, hypersensitivity reactions. Just a simple genotype <coughs> test can really tell you who's going to get it and who will not. About 5% of patients get a back of your hypersensitivity. Um, if they have one of these HLA loci, uh, you can have up to a 103-fold odds ratio of, uh, of risk of getting hypersensitivity reactions. <laughs> It's 100% positive predictive value. If, if a patient has this, uh, this, this genetic background, they're almost certain to get a hypersensitivity. It also has a 97% negative predictive value. If they don't have the SNP, you can be 97% sure that they're not going to get hypersensitivity. And uh, here's one of the, the a conclusion of one of the seminal papers investigating this. Uh, I'm just going to read it. In our population, Australians, withholding a abacavir in those with HLA-B, star 5701, or these other HLAs, should reduce the prevalence of hypersensitivity from 9 to 2.5% without inappropriately denying abacavir to any patient. Uh, and I think that's really a very good summation of the power of these HLA genotypes. So uh, I've sort of given you the bird's eye view of all of the pharmacogenes that are uh, currently out there um, and are, are probably moving towards the translation um, side. Um, now I'm going to just briefly mention one of the platforms that we use to actually get the genotypes uh, in these patients, just talk to you a little bit about it. Um, there's, this, is, this chip, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's an array-based technology called uh, DMET, which stands for Drug Metabolizing Enzymes and Transporters. It has 2,000 variants and 235 um, PKPD genes. Um, so you can see all of these phase one enzymes. Uh, you'll see the ones that I mentioned in there. The phase two enzymes, you'll see the ones I mentioned in there. Transporters, uh, you'll see the ones, again, the SLC01B1 is in here. Um, and then these other genes that can have um, effects on PKPD. So here's G6PD, for example, uh, cytidine deaminase, which is important for certain other drugs. Um, et cetera. Um, this chip is actually, uh, it only costs about $500 to do the chip, and if you batch a lot of samples, as we've learned, it actually costs only about $50 a patient. So it's not uh, some outrageously costly uh, thing to do. 
Um, however, it does have one major deficiency that, that we've, uh, we've identified, and, th and that is that it takes three days to actually get data out of this, and that's, that's a fast turnaround time. So for a lot of these drugs, if you need the information right away, you cannot get it. It's just not possible. This isn't CSI Miami. We can't just genotype something in 15 minutes. Um, so basically, what we've done at the NIH to combat this issue is we have uh, made a policy where a patient gets admitted and then they get this genotyping test done. The information follows them around so that if a clinical decision has to be made rapidly that this information is there and available and will be flagged to the, the clinician who is going to give them the drug. Um, we have based the, uh, so now I'm talking about our, uh, our, our experience with PG testing at uh, NIH. Uh, we've sort of used um, this website called PharmGKB, which uh, is run by um, a lot of the, the pharmacogenetics experts in this country. Uh, they, they're all part of a network called PGRN. Um, and they have really curated the pharmacogenetics literature very well. So if you're interested in this, uh, PharmGKB is an excellent resource for, uh, for, for learning more. Um, They've published levels of evidence. So we have only selected those that have the highest levels of evidence um, that are available. Um, published control studies of good quality relating to phenotype and or genotype patients, healthy volunteers having relevant pharmacokinetic and clinical endpoints. Uh, pretty much everything I'm going to discuss today uh, has that high of a level of evidence. It also has a very high level of clinical relevance. So even though maybe you have a high level of evidence that a SNP is associated with some outcome, that outcome may not be that clinically important. Um, so they've also curated the, the clinical importance of this. And uh, all of these genes I'm about to talk about have a high level of clinical importance as well. Um, so I'm just going to go through the list because I think you, know, you may see some of uh, your favorite drugs on this list. And uh, I'm keep it short so that I don't keep you here for too long. But uh, here we go. Uh, Abacavir, I already mentioned this one, HLA-B5701. Uh, um, this one is recommended, so if an investigator will get flagged and this says you really should, you really need to get this uh, genotype before you can administer Abacavir. Um, and even though says the test says TBD, our, our laboratory uh, medicine branch actually runs this test all of the time, so we're, we're currently processing this SNP through that branch and anybody treated with Abacavir. Allopurinol, um, another drug with uh, hypersensitivity reactions, same story, it's recommended and uh, can be run through the, the lab right now. Azathioprine or any of these mercaptopurine drugs, um, I already mentioned these so I won't go through the mechanism. Um, this is also a very, very highly strongly recommended um, SNP to test before administering any of these drugs and we can actually use the DMET platform to do so. Carbamazepine uh, is another HLA. Um, the FDA recommends testing this in Asian populations. Now, this is an issue here. Uh, so I have a friend in, I'm from California, I have a friend who is, whose grandfather is, uh, was one of the uh, original Japanese immigrants to the, to the United States. Uh, and he doesn't look at all Asian, but he has a significant part of his genome that is Asian. He wouldn't identify himself as Asian. He would identify himself as a Caucasian. Um, if, if he, he was treated with this drug um, because he wasn't Asian and we decided not to genotype him, then he could potentially experience some severe reaction here. We, so we've decided that really looking at a person's um, self-identified race is not the way to go about this. We really need to actually genotype every patient to find out if they have the SNP or not. So this one is actually very recommended. Uh, test is, again, through the laboratory branch. Um, clopidogrel, Plavix, um, the poor metabolizers um, have non-responsiveness to clopidogrel. Um, higher doses may be needed in these patients or there's new, um, there's new antiplatelet agents out that can be used instead of clopidogrel. Um, this one we consider optionally available but we assume that since the information is already available to the, the clinician that they will just opt for one of those other um, uh, antiplatelet agents. Codeine, I already mentioned it. We don't use a lot of codeine at the NIH. Uh, this one still is optional or available. The DMET will give you the information. Fluoropyrimidines um, metabolized by DPYD. Um, patients, patients with uh, deficiencies of DPYD will have uh, some potentially fatal toxicities. Um, so this test is recommended and it's already available uh, to, uh, to the uh, clinician by, via the DMET chip. Interferon alpha uh, has uh, an association with an IL-28 beta SNP. 
Um, this is one SNP is, is very predictive of who is going to respond well to this drug, and another is predictive of who will not respond well to the drug. We consider this optional or available. Um, we have to go outside of the NIH to lab core to really do this one. Renotekin, already mentioned it. We uh, DMET chip already uh, test uh, UGT1A1, so um, this one's already being used. Isoniazid uh, with NAT2. NAT2 is a phase two conjugating enzyme that acetylates isoniazid and gets rid of a, a very reactive intermediate metabolite. Um, if people are slow acetylators, they have a, a threefold increase in drug induced liver in injuries. Um, this one is considered optional or available. The DMET tests it. CYP2E1, uh, similar story. We'll go through it. Optional or available. Phenytoin, difficult drug to dose. Um, there are some variants in CYP2C9. Um, which affect the toxicity and efficacy. This information will be available uh, for dosing of phenytoin. Phenytoin also causes some uh, hypersensitivity reactions, and there's an HLA that's predictive. So this one's strongly recommended, and the test is done through the laboratory branch. Rasburicase, which I already mentioned, G6PD genotyping is uh, already available through DMET. Statins and OATP1B1 mentioned it. The test is available through DMET. Tamoxifen, 2D6, test is available through DMET. Warfarin, same SNPs, DMET test. Um, and then we have uh, the Molecular Pathology Laboratory who is already uh, doing all of the somatic mutations for these targeted agents. So I'll just run through the targeted agents and not mention much about them. Uh, Trastuzumab, Lipatinib, um, Matinib, Dasatinib, and Nilotinib. Um, and that Matinib also affects KIT, so we have the Molecular Pathology Test Kit for us. Um, Jafitinib, Berlotinib, and these others, um, BRAF inhibitors, EGFR inhibitors, uh, RET inhibitors, alkylating agents, and uh, that's it. So those are all the drugs that we have implemented at this point at the NIH in the PG testing uh, arena. Um, so just a couple of final thoughts. How many drugs have pharmacogenetic markers in the label? Well, at this point, there are 114 of these drugs, and if you go onto this website at the FDA, you can, you can look at all of these drugs. How many drugs have FDA recommendations that are actually actionable? Um, seven have boxed warnings that, where the testing is very important. Uh, 29 have indications and usage information, and 24 will give you information about the dosage. Um, so a subset of those are actionable. And the last slide here, uh, just considering the prevalence of use of pharmacogenetically um, affected drugs. There's about 24 million people, this was in 2008, using drugs that, are, uh, that have pharmacogenetic information that's available, um, that, that you could just genotype them and, and know what, what, you know, know more information anyway about what to do, uh, make clinical decisions. There's a lot of people using these drugs. This, this number is just ever increasing, and eventually I think this stuff is really going to be uh, important in uh, clinical medicine. And uh, Doug Figg, my boss, uh, always ends his talk by saying, at one day he envisions a child is born, the child gets a DMET chip-like genetic test, and that test can be carried with, uh, with them through life on a thumb drive, and they can go hand it to their doctor one day, doctor put it into a database, it'll tell them, don't give this drug, do give this drug. So that seems to be the way that things are going. And so that's all I have to say, and thank you very much. Comments or questions? Yes. Uh, I want to start a patient on clopidogrel. Mm -hmm. How do I find out if it's going to be effective? What do I actually do? Could you, could you paraphrase the question for a uh, Yeah. Uh, so the question was, how do you find out if a patient is at risk for uh, clopidogrel uh, inefficacy? And uh, you, you can use a few options. The first option, is you can send it off to, um, to have it genotyped by a private company. There are several private companies out there right now doing this. Um, the test really needs to have, I think, three different alleles. And each one of those alleles can cost a certain amount of money. Um, and we found that it's actually cheapest to just have the DMET chip run on people. You can take the blood sample, you can send it to the Coriel Institute, they will give you the information back. Um, a guy named Norman Jerry there is the guy we run through. Uh, he's doing all the NIH studies. You can get this information back and then make the decision based on that. Yes. Um, thank you for a great talk. Um, you raised a lot of important issues. I, I'm sure I see at least one patient a week who's either a slow or rapid metabolizer that's 
not doing well clinically. Uh -huh. There was a Dr. Flockhart in private practice who used to do consults. Yeah. So um, uh, how can we get a consult in terms of private practice to help us? Because you know, there's two issues. One is a specific drug, but one is uh, metabolizers slower that might affect many, many drugs, and that might be beyond the expertise of a private practice doctor. That's absolutely right. Uh, I, I know there's some agencies that are, uh, that are springing up that uh, offer pharmacogenetic consulting uh, to clinicians. Um, it's a very new thing. You can Google search it. Um, I know that uh, Doug Fig was approached by one of these, um, these agencies. I, I forget the name of it. Um, but we're also at the NIH, and I'm sure we can, we can direct you in the right direction. Uh, I think my email is up here. Um, and if we can't help you, I'm sure we can put you in touch with somebody who can at this point. Those of you who are entrepreneurs, it sounds like that's an opportunity. It is, definitely. <laughs> I, I want to reiterate uh, the uh, excellent nature of this program and quite timely and relevant to uh, private practice. Uh, interestingly enough, just from an historical point of view, the 6MD uh, discoverers won the Nobel Prize. You may be aware of that mm -hmm. machine from Alien in the 1980s. But to take that a step further, there uh, have been some recent guidelines that have been published by a national, or our national organization suggesting that uh, HLA D5801 uh, 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 profiles be obtained. Mm -hmm. and certain groups of patients who are uh, going to be administered allopurinol, that happens to be the Han Chinese and certain Thai subgroups. But getting back to your California story, mm -hmm. uh, you wonder how many of, of these particular groups uh, may be here and vulnerable because this is so important for the allopurinol hypersensitivity syndrome. Uh, so from bench to bedside, this is recommended. We're looking at the economics of this as we speak, um, and for the practicality and, and uh, bench to bedside, uh, we are told that this uh, uh, HLA B5801 is now available commercially. Um, is this an area that you are uh, have studied uh, more than your uh, uh, slides? I'm not an expert on HLAs by uh, any stretch of the imagination, um, but I, I, I do know the allopurinol story, um, and, and I agree with the sentiment that, that we really need to genotype everyone. Um, so I'm not sure exactly, can, is there, is, did that answer your question, or? Well, it was a statement and a question just to point out the relevancy of, of this discussion relative to the clinical practice. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, I think that this needs to be genotyped uh, in clinical practice. It, is, it absolutely needs to be done because it's so predictive of who's going to get these toxicities. It's, it's very if important. If it isn't done, then you, the national organizations who are suggesting it, this may uh, entertain another level of culpability by not doing it. That's true. I, I actually, uh, I looked up before I came here, I, I always look to see if there has been yet a, a lawsuit uh, for malpractice uh, about one of these things popping up. Nobody has yet sued anybody and won, as far as I can tell from Google, um, for not doing one of these HLA tests. However, I have found, uh, you mentioned allopurinol, uh, a woman was misdiagnosed with gout, was given allopurinol, got Stevens-Johnson, sued, and won $6 million. So clearly, it is, it is uh, something that needs to be addressed clinically. You'll, you'll see advertisements on television very quickly on this matter, I think. <laughs> It's entre but, lawyers are entrepreneurs too. Right? Another yeah. point, okay. uh, I'm reminded that Norman Shumway, in response to a congressional question at a hearing, made the observation that none of us are purebreds. <laughs> That's definitely true, especially in America. <laughs> we are very admixed. Hi, thank you Hi. for a wonderful talk. Thank you. Um, Yeah, thank you. Um, so there was a paper published um, by the people at St. Jude who came up with the TPMT uh, observation. And they talked about 
genetic excellence. The, the genetic tests are held to a higher standard than your standard clinical assays just because they're, people want them to be so predictive of everything, although they never really will meet that benchmark. Um, so I think that, uh, that there is a lot of resistance out there um, right now to implementing a lot of this stuff because of that issue. Secondarily, uh, the CYP2D6 tamoxifen story has been recently stalled by two published studies that came out at the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium showing no relationship between CYP2D6 uh, and tamoxifen outcome. Now, these two studies were fundamentally flawed. There's an editorial by Mark Retain in Cancer Letters. Um, talking about how these two studies both violate a fundamental law of nature, the random sorting of alleles amongst populations. And the reason for this is that these, uh, these folks genotyped tumors and did not genotype the germline DNA. The tumors get mutated and it's not an accurate reflection of what's going on in the liver, how much endoxifen is actually being formed. Um, so th these studies have a lot of impediments to them um, that, are, that are outside the control of uh, a lot of us who are doing the science. So, Yes, uh, again, I'd like to thank you for an outstanding talk. Uh, I'm involved with the PAT initiative at the hospital, so when I yep. hear something like this, you know, my mouth waters a bit. And I wonder, uh, is the Institute uh, interested or, or in thinking about perhaps doing some test drives in community hospitals? I think that uh, you know our, our group would be partially interested in it. Uh, Doug Price here uh, is, is, is coming for some moral support. He's a fellow staff scientist in our lab, so I mean I think we could probably talk to Doug Fig about that, maybe doing some of those studies. Uh, Juan Lertora is the guy that runs the PG program right now at NIH, and I think you could definitely approach him and ask. Uh, he would be, he's always interested to talk about this sort of information. Would you comment on the role, of, the traditional role of pharmacists and protecting patients and how you see that evolve? Well, I mean, for, for this, I think uh, pharmacists are not geneticists, and uh, I know that very well because I am a geneticist and I have to deal with pharmacists all the time. I think that uh, what needs to really happen here on the pharmacy side is that we need to have some very good curated databases where you can just put in genotype information and, and the people who are experts in genetics and all of the other fields that are needed to really understand this information, this database just spits out a clinical decision that should be made rather than having the pharmacist do it all. So in fact, at the end of the day, um, one could conceive of um, system that doesn't lead to alarm fatigue, which happens now a lot in pharmacies. I mm -hmm. get a bunch of interaction messages and eventually the pharmacists ignore them. Uh, it's it's going to take a lot of work, it seems. Yeah. Bob, we've been waiting. <laughs> um, there's a small but significant uh, incidence of, sorry, small but significant incidence of um, fatal malignancies in pharmacies, I believe, Inflammatory bowel patients, mm -hmm. maybe rheumatoid arthritis patients, yep. with TNF and insects per capita. Any uh, data on genotyping? Um, I don't know of any, but I, I, I'm more of a, a cancer researcher, so uh, I can't say that there's not. Um, I was actually recently diagnosed with psoriatic arthritis, and my doc actually mentioned that to me when I went to him. Um, so. Oh, I'm sorry. The question was um, basically uh, there's uh, secondary malignancies in certain diseases like uh, arthritis, um, inflammatory bowel disease, and the question was, do you see secondary malignancies um, that are related to the uh, to those diseases? I think is basically what you're saying, right? Or is there a genotype that would be predisposed? Or a genotype that's predisposed. So that's that's more of a uh, a risk allele, less of a, a pharmacogenetic allele. Um, I could see maybe that, that if you were treated with azathioprine for uh, inflammatory bowel disease that you might see secondary malignancies in patients with certain variants, but um, uh, the disease alleles I, I just don't know much about. Yeah. Huh? You raised an important issue in terms of clinical trials, and that is, you know, maybe we should lower the patient population to the people most likely to benefit. Um, one example that I see every day is glucosamine chondroitin works in a subset of the population, but it's said ineffective when you look at the whole population. Are we any closer to 
using genetics in clinical trials to make drugs more effective? Uh, there are several out there in the literature right now that are, that are finally doing this, which is exciting. I mean, we really needed the prospective side uh, of this. Now, I, I know that there is some resistance to drug companies to, to do, from drug companies to do these sorts of studies because they want their drug to work in the whole population and want to subset it. So oftentimes you'll see these, 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 these pros prospective studies uh, already being done on approved drugs. I'm not aware of any drugs that are being developed at this point uh, with pharmacogenetics in mind, but I also don't work for drug companies, so I don't really know for sure. <laughs> Other comments or questions? Yes, sir. I, in the world of saving a few bucks, have you ever noticed any, any, any difference between a generic drug and a, uh, from a, from the po a genetic point of view? No, the same drug, I don't think anybody has, has ever done a study like that. I think we, we primarily assume that a generic and, a, and a, a, an on-label, or a, I'm sorry, a, I forget the name, uh, you know, a drug that's produced by a drug company uh, is, are the same compound. So I don't think we ever look at generics versus the drug company's drugs. So the American College of Physicians did a survey on something like 500 of their their fellows and members um, and asked a bunch of questions about this sort of thing and found that A, internists believe that this is a really important field for the future practice of medicine and B, felt very incompetent in being able to use it. And it seems to me that revolves around competency rather than knowledge. And one of the reasons we were very interested in having a pharmacogenetics talk here is that this one is very, very close to the clinic at the bedside. And it seems like maybe we ought to do some more of this. What do you think? Yes. I see heads nodding and maybe we should do a bit more of it. I want to thank you very much, Dr. Yes, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, hi. So, um, so I'm Chair of